Oh my God, this woman's a very hard act to follow. So uh, look at me, I'm putting my finger in the water. I'm Lorraine Leeson. I'm the director of the Centre for Deaf Studies at Trinity College in Dublin. But I'm in honour of the day. I'm wearing the cork colours. I have. I have to also add, have a passport to Cork. I worked in this building before many years ago, so it's very nice to be back in Cork. I hope you let me stay. Um, today, I'm absolutely honoured that Jill allowed Teresa, Lucia, and myself the time to tell you a little bit about the Justice Science Project. And I'm so pleased. I can't tell you how happy I am to see the people in the room here in the room. And uh, in case I forget later on, I also want to say we all have an open invitation to an event that we're going to run next February when we will be presenting on the, the final results of our own Justice Science project and hopefully we can even convince some of you to sit on a couple of panels for us and engage with us along the way. Um, so let me just tell you a little bit about the, um, the Justice Science project. Some of the stuff that I, I'll, I'll skip through is stuff that Jill has so beautifully set the scene on. Um, so in terms of, you know, how she presented the views of the deaf community, in terms of how deaf communities position themselves, um, attitudes to language and language use, and some of the things that Willie has said around the, uh, the complete disenfranchisement of, of deaf communities and the, the reluctance to recognise their languages as real languages, that has real and persistent consequences for people in all aspects of life, and we really can't underestimate that. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, one of the things that we're going to add to what Jill has said perhaps <coughs> is that you know, sometimes there's this assumption that if we provide an interpreter, problem solved, solution, quick fix, it's grand. Well, not only is it about just having the right interpreter, but it's also about more than that. Because as several people have alluded to, we, are, we don't exist in a vacuum. We construct identities, we make assumptions about people. I can't tell you how many times I've been asked if I'm the secretary of the Centre for Deaf Studies um, because I happen to be the little... <laughs> <laughs> and I've even had one fine colleague in Trinity ask me who the man in charge was over there, um, to which I responded that would be me. So we construct identities and that has impact. It has impact in terms of the relationships that we unfold <coughs> and in terms of the way things unfold. And I think it linked in very nicely with what you were saying about, you know, is this person a good witness? Um, can we assume that they're going to actually do the business for us when it gets to court? Uh, or are we wasting our resources here when we could invest them elsewhere? Uh, so that, that's something that we might want to talk about. Uh, just to get us started, this is an event. This was a case that was in the papers that you may have come across. Yeah, Edward Connors, deaf man, found guilty of manslaughter in Dublin. A uh, man went under a bus. Uh, but what was really interesting, and in we're talking about construction of identity, is you know how these headlines play out. So in the, the main headline here, what was salient at the time was the fact that he was a homeless man, and homelessness was on the political agenda. So that obviously was going to take precedence. Uh, the fact that he was deaf, and as you see here, this is the Irish Times, and cannot speak, gets seven-year sentence. Uh, but also in here, they talk about the fact that he was a heroin addict, that he was a member of the travelling community. Uh, and so, you know, another thing that we have to think about is not just the fact that somebody's deaf, but also how that intersects. There's an idea um, that comes from feminist theory, but was put forward by uh, an American lawyer called intersectionality. And it looks at how, you know, gender, race, disability, how they come into interplay and how institutions respond or don't respond to that. So that you have, you know, the idea that people often talk about double discrimination or multiple discrimination. And I think that that's something that needs to be teased out a little bit more. It's having its moment in deaf studies. People are starting to talk about this and to explore it. Uh, so that's, that's something we should think about. I suppose for us, a starting point is the idea of parity of esteem, parity of access and parity of participation. How do deaf people engage with the justice system on these three levels. You know, are they considered to have parity esteem? Notionally, yes. But as we've seen from Jill's presentation, the experience that deaf people report on suggests that it's far from their actual experience in their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, and again, this isn't just true for the justice system. It's also true in other spheres that we've looked at. When we look at deaf people's access to healthcare, for example, we have the same kinds of problems uh, in terms of barriers to participation arising. Um, so you might have parity of esteem. You might notionally have the same legal rights as somebody else, 
That doesn't mean that you actually have the same access when it comes down to it. And it definitely does not mean that you have the same parity of participation. So, you know, I think that it's just it's a simple way of starting to think about, okay, notionally we may be all equal citizens under the law, but in practice, how does that actually pan out? So let me tell you about the project. Um, and here's another, this is a, a clip from another headline recently around a deaf guy with 186 convictions. Uh, and the judge was giving him his last chance, uh, allegedly. So about the project, this kind of gives the background. Um, the, the project is funded by the European Commission to the Erasmus Plus program. Um, <coughs> this is typically, it's a program that supports the development of training materials and resources uh, for people in vocational settings. Um, for us, it gives us an opportunity to engage in action research. So what we want to do in Trinity, we train sign language interpreters, but we also try very hard to engage with other key stakeholders in terms of finding ways to have, again, Euro speak, you know, the multiplier effect. How do we make sure that what we do doesn't just serve 15 students a year? How does it actually have an increased and incremental impact beyond that? So we do work across the board. So one of our goals is to create training resources for legal professionals, uh, including our good friends in blue, around working with deaf communities. Um, we want to also provide resources for sign language interpreters, and we want to provide deaf communities, critically, with access to, uh, to understanding what does it mean for them when they're in these, what we call triadic exchanges, so we have a hearing party, a deaf party, and interpretation. What does that mean? It's not, again, equally for the, for the guard, say, in this scenario, what does it mean when you're working with an interpreter? You know, there's this assumption that I say it, you sign it, it's the same thing. It's not the same thing because languages package information differently. How many of you know another language? Okay. So even think back to Irish, right, when you were in school. Queer me mokota orum. If you were to literally translate that, you get put me my coat on me. Yeah? So you know, you're not going to actually get the same exact sense of meaning when you're working through an interpretation. When you're working with a sign language, because you're using a different modality, sign languages are incredibly accurate with respect to how things happen in the real world and how you talk about those things, much more so than spoken English, for example, or many other spoken languages. So if you're talking about somebody passed by me, you know, somebody walked by me, well, if you were to ask, if I were to ask you, draw that, you know, where were you relative to the person who walked by you? Something that the guards might want to know if they're investigating a complaint. You have to figure it out, yeah? But for a sign language user, they're going to tell you where they were relative to the person. Did they brush by them? And at what relative degree of distance from their body? And on what side of their body? And in what manner was that person walking? All of that information is encoded. So we have to think about what does that mean then when we come to interpret in legal settings, where accuracy is the preceding governing, uh, I suppose, directive for interpreters at work. <coughs> so what we have to do when we're talking about interpretation, and I'm sorry, I'm going to, I've kind of threw in a few extra slides this morning because I thought, I want to say some more about interpretation because that's really a critical thing. And um, I'm kind of drawing on this idea from a, uh, a translation studies expert at Dublin City University. I should spit there, that's the competition. Um, you know, very, very well known. Michael Cronin is a wonderful translation studies scholar. And he talks about bridging the distance of difference via translation. But I don't think that's quite right. I think when we're talking about interpreting, we're actually negotiating that. Because the assumption is we're bridging the difference. The assumption is that you say it, I sign it, they sign back to me, I say it, and it's an exact replica. And it goes back to Jill's point about uh, orality and articulateness. But often, actually, it's about not just how articulate is the deaf person, but how articulate is the interpreter. Not just about how accurate is the deaf person, but how accurate is the interpreter, uh, and how are they reflecting that. So in fact, what we've got is, you know, if we have, say, a hearing client and a deaf client, the assumption is they want to feel like they're having direct communication. 
but they're not. There is an interpreter there, and the interpreter can skew communication just as they can help communication. And I think you know we need to go into that with our eyes wide open. And there have been a number of cases, not least one just a week ago, that was thrown out of court because of issues around interpretation. Uh, and again, these aren't just sign language issues. This is also true if we're talking about spoken language to spoken language interpretation. Uh, I think that's a critical thing. So instead of us assuming that interpreters do this, yeah, and you get the same message, in fact, what we need, yeah, this is, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry for this. This is work in progress, and this is just my current attempt to capture things. One of the things that Jill also talked about was a power differential that plays out when people are working uh, in settings where they're in a minority and they're encountering an institutional approach to things or you know they're in a majority setting. It's not just about that power differential though because it's also about effort. I've been involved in a lot of studies over the past few years that kind of led me to, to try and figure out how do we account for this. Like for example, I worked with colleagues from eight countries where we interviewed deaf leaders. And when I say deaf leaders, they include deaf politicians. We have two deaf MEPs at the moment who are sign language users. They included people like the president of the World Federation of the Deaf, who is the representative of the deaf community to the United Nations. We had amazing people who very kindly gave their time. And what they talked about was when they're choosing interpreters, they have the autonomy to select who they want. And they talked about how, for them, they were bilingual, they knew the context they were going into, but sometimes they said if the interpreter wasn't quite up to scratch and wasn't open to feedback, it meant that the effort for them as a deaf person to fully engage in that event was significantly diminished. Now these are bilingual, highly qualified, highly skilled people. If we take as Willie said, you know, the other end of the spectrum, if you take a deaf victim of crime, or if you take Edward Connors, or you know, this other deaf guy with 187 convictions, typically there are people who have had experiences of abuse, who have had, they're, they're, they don't have functional literacy. The education system has failed them desperately. There's been a lack of psychiatric support, no mental health services for young deaf people in Ireland. So they've had all of these other issues that come to bear. It means then that they have a limited, the FOI is for fund of information. They, they have limited literacy, they have limited <coughs> access to information, and suddenly they're hauled into a police station and they're being interrogated. What do they know about that event and what that means relative to what does, you know, somebody else is very streetwise maybe uh, know what it means, what these things represent when they're in that same context. They're also, those people who end up in police stations or those people who end up reporting crimes as victims of crime, they're less likely potentially to have had a higher education. Now, why is that important? Well, because in Ireland, if you are familiar with working with an interpreter, it's most typically because you have gone to third level. In Ireland, unfortunately, because of the lack of provision of interpreters across the board, it's really hit and miss. Yeah. So the people in Ireland who are most familiar with working interpreters are the people who are most bilingual, who have the best education already, and the people who most need the interpreters because they're victims of crime or because they are that deaf person who's in the frame for a crime are less likely to have done that. So the effort for them in engaging with the situation, this isn't bleeding heart stuff, this is simply, it's a matter of fact, yeah, that they are not only doubly disadvantaged, they are incredibly disadvantaged vis-a-vis -vis understanding what does this mean and in terms of understanding what's going on in, in a given context by interpretation. So this will be one of the reasons why Teresa will tell you that in Ireland we're focusing in on trying to also develop capacity amongst deaf interpreters. But I better run along or uh, I won't get there. So we're talking about, with that as a background in terms of the interpreting side of things and talking about, well, you know, if the interpretation provision is the quick fix, so then we need to be understanding fully what does that mean for us in practice and what are the possible problems that can arise even in that context. So we're, we're doing a whole ton of things. Um, you know, some of the stuff Jill has already said, you know, deaf community have said for years in many jurisdictions that there are problems around access and so we're trying to build on that. Um, 
We're going to develop a course that's in progress at the moment. Um, we're also developing some online content, so that might go some way towards uh, accessing people who otherwise wouldn't be able to access the content because of um, funding constraints. Um, we are going to have content available in a range of sign languages, and it will be subtitled material, and it will try and represent the views of a range of people from legal, uh, police, particularly because our, our focus has gone from the broader range of access to the legal system to focusing specifically on police interactions, because what we've found when we look at the literature and what we know from our own practical experience is that if something goes to court and there's been a problem with the police process, it's going to fall down, it's going to be thrown out, or there are going to be, I mean, any good barrister worth their salt is going to say, oh, but there were problems in terms of the communication, right? So, so let's start in, in the police settings. Um, and in starting that, what we've done is we've just completed a review of interpreting provision in legal settings in 31 countries. And that will be available later in this year. We have it in draft form. Um, we're working, I should have said, we're working with some phenomenal partners. We're working with Harriet Watt University in Scotland. They have a great tradition of working with the Scottish Constabulary, as well as a number of other police forces around the UK. Um, another partner is uh, the Catholic University of Leuven in Antwerp. And they were, again, also very involved, both in working with spoken and sign language interpreting. The Flemish police force have a sign language unit, did you know? Um, so you know they've they've got this wealth of experience that we can build on as we're starting off on this front. But as it happens, Ireland actually has the greatest expertise to bring to bear in terms of interpreter education in this consortium. And so you know again, as Jill says, often we think, oh Ireland, we don't possibly know what we're doing. In fact, very often we do know what we're doing. And I suppose we need to grow up and be able to to say sometimes we actually do know what we're doing. So this is some of the stuff that we're we're at. And so we're going to present a whole range of things. In terms of the Irish focus, we're getting to a point where we are stepping into our research piece. Um, we're actually, we're working with the Gardaí. We've managed to secure the approval of the Garda Commissioner to, that's no mean thing, but I understand it, to engage with the Gardaí. So we've been working with David McIntyre and um, um, Darren Coventry Howlett, that's a mouthful to remember, uh, in the, and I can never remember the whole, thank you, it's, it's a, it, they need an acronym, that's easy, the <laughs> Intercultural Diversity and Racial uh, Engagement Group in Harcourt Street, and they've been fabulous, and in fact, Darren hoped to come today, but because of Ching, uh, he wasn't allowed to come down on the train, so <laughs> we're going to have to report back, unfortunately, but again, I think that speaks to the point, you know, resources are incredibly tight, and so there are consequences for that, and that stymies the best of intentions in the world sometimes. Um, but we are working on that. So in Ireland, we're going to have a questionnaire um, and focus groups with Gardaí and with deaf community members and interpreters. Um, we're following a model that we used before when we looked at deaf people's access to healthcare that was very, very successful. Um, and we're also, in Ireland, particularly piloting content for the training of of prospective deaf interpreters. We're going to, again, not say too much because Teresa will say something there. And the goal then will be that the, the content that we create <coughs> is research led because there's no point in us going on our gut instincts here. We need to have data and we need to have reliable information that we're basing any claims on. Um, okay, so there they are. There's the Gardaí that we're working with. Um, you know, in terms of the content, in terms of our discussions already, uh, I'm sure. Some of the people in the room can close their ears now because you know more about this than I do. Uh, you know, but interviews with suspects are highly time critical. So if you're arresting somebody, you really can't be waiting around to find the right interpreter. Very often it's about having an interpreter. That's a problem though, because if you don't have the right interpreter, if you just say, well, let's get you know so-and-so's brother or sister in, that's not going to work. And as a practitioner, I'm also an interpreter, as a practitioner who has worked quite a lot in legal settings over the years, I'm delighted to see that there is a much greater level of awareness amongst Gardaí in terms of asking, what are your credentials? Are you a trained interpreter? Have you done this before? Do you know the witness? You know, and that, that, that that's something that really needs to progress. But there have been cases where the guards haven't asked that, and it's turned out after the fact, when the case goes to court, that the interpreter did have a relationship in some way, shape, or form with a deaf witness. 
and that's stymied a case. You know, so <coughs> it's these things are important to to think about and to make Gardaí uh, aware of because, as you said earlier on, you know that they're the first point of, of reference. Uh, they are the people who come on the scene first. So in terms of thinking about how do we secure appropriate interpreters, but it's not just about as the statutory instrument that uh, Minister Shatter prepared to translate the European Directive uh, on the provision of interpreters in legal settings into Irish law. It's not just about the provision of an interpreter. How long do you think an interpreter can work before quality starts to diminish? Mm -hmm. Any other? 40. Yeah, I mean, so somewhere in between that, so about 15 to 20, depending on the complexity, <coughs> it can be 15 to 20, 20 to 30 minutes. But if you look internationally, the best practice guidelines are you should be swapping an interpreter every 30 <laughs> minutes. Yeah. And yet, very often, you find one interpreter booked to come into a police station. And how long does an interrogation last? Oh, days. Yeah. There you go. So you have a problem, you know, if you're talking <coughs> about insured quality provision and wanting to make sure that something is robust enough to stand up in court, that's an issue. And of course, the cost factor does kick in, but the problem is, what's the cost of losing a case because people are questioning the robustness of the interpretation in the first place? So, you know, I think we have to think about what does that mean in the bigger picture? And if we want to make sure that we have justice that is served and seen to be served and is safe, well, then there are things that we need to think about. So we also need to think about the other issues that might be impacting on interaction. So cultural issues, literacy issues, mental health considerations. Do I need a deaf interpreter? Is it a foreign deaf person? Yeah? There's been a case where there was a foreign deaf person involved. And so then you need to have uh, a deaf interpreter or find an interpreter from that person's country. Yeah? How are you going to do that? How are you going to make sure then that that unfolds? Um, fortunately, they're very far and few between, right? But it's just something for us to be mindful of in an increasingly globalized society. Then what about working with interpreters? <coughs> Our interpreters today are working simultaneously. But if you're in a legal setting, you actually want your interpreters to work consecutively because the research has been demonstrating that the quality, the accuracy of interpretation when the interpreter stops, understands what's being said, signs, waits to see what's being said, and then works back the accuracy level goes up by about 10 percent yeah you might think well it's only 10 percent and it's much faster if we work simultaneously but again if this is about justice and if it's about making sure that things happen the way they're supposed to happen that's the trade-off so you know it's all about these tensions between we have limited time we need to get started we need to get this done fast versus we want to make sure that this actually pans through in practice uh, in the real world and then there are issues in terms of the provision of interpreters in court settings. There's been a ton of research. You can send you the PowerPoint. You're all going to come to Dublin next February, so we can say some more about that then. Um, and then just a little note about the prison services. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Lucia because she's been sort of doing a little bit of our preliminary work around <coughs> this. Uh, but <coughs> she's going to tell us. Uh, okay, my name is Lucia and um, I'm working as a research assistant for Just in Sign project. And um, I started my research um, focusing on the Irish prisons um, because we wanted to know at the beginning how many deaf and uh, or hard of hearing people were in uh, inside the Irish prisons in all over Ireland. So the first thing we did, we contacted the Irish prison service, the IPS, and the reply was, uh, we are sorry, but we don't record we don't know the number, we don't know if how many deaf people, how many hard of, hard of hearing people are in the Irish prisons. And so they told me to contact the Irish uh, Penal Reform Trust. So I contact them and say, do you have information about how many deaf people or hard of hearing people are in the Irish prisons? And they, <coughs> they suggested me to contact the IPS. So. Then I went on and um, I contacted different associations like uh, probation services all over Ireland or um, organization working with ex-offenders and see if they were working with deaf people and hard of hearing people but they didn't have any report or any data about deaf people or anything. 
So then discussing with my team, we decided to contact each prison and to send a letter to each prison <coughs> and see if they have <coughs> data or the number. And a few of them reply saying, we don't know how many we have inside our institute. So the next step was uh, we decided to contact the cen Central Statistic Office, the CSO, mm -hmm. and uh, they sent us a report saying, uh, Based on the census 2011, there are 87 deaf people. Um, that means deaf, hard of hearing, sign language users, or no sign language users. 87. So um, it was uh, it was pretty shocking. Like um, the number is so high, but nobody didn't know or couldn't give me the number. So I wonder if it was the same in other countries. So we did like a literature review and compare Ireland with other different countries and uh, it, the problem was um, actually, it was the same. Um, it was a critical issues even in other countries saying we don't, actually most of the time, uh, these institutions don't know about uh, their own clients. So this is um, the main issue is uh, actually prison should know and need to know about uh, if <coughs> they have deaf prisoners, if they have art of hearing prisoners in order to be able to uh, accommodate them and to provide the right service while they are in prisons. So um, we were talking about it and uh, what can we suggest or what can we do while we are working with just the same project. First of all, exactly, we should prisons need to know if they have uh, deaf, deaf people within their institution and based on that work with, for example, other deaf organizations or there are so many, there are different deaf organizations within Ireland and it should be good uh, if prison contact or link with them in order to ask for information or uh, advise how to work with deaf people because it's basically, uh, there is a lack of awareness and uh, so even people working in prison need training, like the same with Garda or any other group and um, like providing deaf awareness and, um, and other uh, communication support. And if, uh, for example, the prisons know about the number, if uh, the staff within prison are trained and if they are in contact with other deaf organizations, maybe they can help and support and provide a better service. As uh, uh, Lorraine was saying, there was uh, the two deaf people had 164 convictions and the other one 186. They should like provide education and rehabilitation while they are in prison. Otherwise, they go back to the society and the trouble, they continue to repeat the same trouble if they don't, pro <coughs> they don't receive the the right uh, support and communication. So, the other thing we should say there is that we've been liaising very closely um, with a number of deaf organisations around this issue. So I know Lucia has been talking with Deaf Here because they provide a lot of social work support to people, uh, and they've been very helpful mm -hmm. in terms of you know thinking about where we can go with, with this particular part. And of course, this is all preliminary because we need to actually, <coughs> we're hoping we'll have research ethics clearance by next week so we can then actually push forward with uh, the actual data collection proper. Um, okay, so we've talked about this. We've talked about what constitutes reasonable accommodation. Oh, actually, there was one other thing I wanted to say to you. Is back here, we just have a little screenshot. Um, this is from a very interesting Al Jazeera uh, documentary program. They did a two-part documentary on deaf people in prison in the USA. So you can find that online if you want. It's it's heartbreaking, but but worth uh, a view. Um, so prison services. So in terms of the interpreting services, as people have said, Willie, you said it earlier on. How many <coughs> times are interpreters requested? We don't know. How many interpreters requested and not provided? How many times do deaf people ask for interpreters and not get them provided? How many times is the assumption that whoever the hearing person who comes along with the deaf person will do? But what happens, like I remember being at a conference and somebody talked about um, a deaf person going to the doctor complaining of headaches and they brought their husband along as the interpreter and the doctor couldn't get to the bottom of why the person was having headaches and sent them off for tests and blah, 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 blah. blah. This has gone on for months and months and months. And then finally this deaf, this woman, she wasn't deaf, but this woman came along with another interpreter and it turned out that her husband had been beating her. 
Yeah. So the appropriateness of the interpreter is essential if you want to actually hear somebody's story, if you want it to be appropriate, if you want to make sure that you know, you're putting in place a, an appropriate system where you really are hearing a story and that it's a reliable story and that you're safeguarding all parties in the event. Um, there are also challenges. Uh, there's a, colleagues in, in Leuven and in Harriet Watt were involved in another <coughs> project, European Commission funded, called Co Minor, where they were looking specifically, it'd be interesting for you perhaps, uh, they were looking at what happens when you have child victims of crime where interpretation is required. They included sign language interpreting, but they were also looking at spoken language interpreting. And they broke the process down into the challenges that for interpreters on arrival. Uh, in waiting room areas, interpreting during the session, and then leaving an assignment or a location. Yeah, and all of those things are important because you know, again, in another project when we looked at access to healthcare, we also looked at access to to mental healthcare. We had one Irish interpreter who reported being sexually assaulted on the way out of an interpreting assignment by a client who was being seen by a psychiatrist about sexual assault related issues. Yeah, so they're not again; these are not mundane or trivial issues. The, the whole issue around you know, who, when, when does the interpreter arrive, who do they have contact with, how much information are they told, uh, where do they wait, how are they introduced, are they seen as being for the hearing institution or for the deaf person, how do they maintain their neutrality, their impartiality, what about debriefing, what about vicarious trauma, uh, you know, all of those things uh, need to be thought about. Uh, and what about the legal basis for the provision of interpreters? Is that robust enough? Um, in Minister Shatter's, I have to say, when I saw the statutory instruments, I thought if a student in first year had given me this as an attempt, I would have sent it back to him and said, listen, seriously, this is ridiculously poor, because they didn't include any reference to the European directives made reference to the need to put in place a register of legal interpreters and he didn't even make reference to that in the statutory instrument. So what about the legal basis for the provision of interpreters? Why are we not talking about this if we're serious about, about justice? And there are a ton of European directives, some of which Jill has already talked about and I'm conscious of time so I'm, I'm going to just say there are lots of them and they make lots of reference to good things about equality and access but a lot of that then comes back to, you know, in terms of the three Ps, parity of esteem grand and notionally parity of access but is that actually going to happen on the ground how do we make sure that, that happens on the ground um, I've talked about the statutory instruments and there are still some problems I stuck these this, these are both from the US and um, Marley Matlin any of you know the name Marley Matlin famous deaf actress winner of an Oscar and a Golden Globe Award many years ago for um, children of a lesser god. Her husband happens to be a police officer in the States and so they've actually been joining up with the National Association for the Deaf there uh, and talking about access to police services. <coughs> so, uh, you could have a look at that if you like. Other issues in terms of, you know, in court, judges will make sure interpreters can be seen. Very practical things. Myself and Lucia were in court a couple of weeks ago observing a case and at one point the interpreter very appropriately uh, put their hand up because there was an issue around the speed and the complexity of the, the dialogue. Nobody noticed. Nobody noticed. So there was about five minutes, ten minutes, where there was no interpretation and nobody noticed that there was no interpretation. So you have these two parallel experiences in terms of the illusion of participation, the illusion of inclusion is there, but the practice in real terms doesn't necessarily play out in practice even when part, you know, the, 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 <coughs> at a notional level, everybody's on the same page and wants to see the right thing being done, but then how do you make sure that that actually is happening uh, in real terms? Okay, so I'm going to jump over these. I'm conscious of time. I know that we started a little bit late, but I'm going to jump over some of these things. Um, we're going to have some focus groups. We're going to run um, parallel processes to those that are in place with colleagues in Harriet Watt University in Scotland. We want to benchmark the experiences of the key stakeholders because, again, you know, it's all fine and well when we have these anecdotal stories to tell, but unless you can pull them together in some meaningful way, of course, policymakers don't really want to know. And, uh, you know, they'll, I'm sure the Garda Commissioner will be saying, well, how many deaf people are we talking about? And how many deaf victims of crime are we talking about? 
but it should be the case, as you said, Jill, that it's not just about quantity, it's also about, you know, citizenship. You know, if we're citizens, well then what does that mean? Um, and we're going to pilot, <laughs> come on, Teresa, <laughs> we're going to pilot some training for prospective deaf interpreters. So Teresa will tell you why that's important. Hello, everybody. I'm nervous. Anyway, I have been waiting a long time, and finally it's my turn. <laughs> anyway, I w grew up deaf. My first language is Irish Sign Language. You have been listening to Jill's presentation, Lorraine's presentation, Lucia's, and for deaf people, Irish Sign Language is their first language. We're talking about the provision of interpreters, just like we would have here. And I'm sure as you're looking at me and you're wondering, a deaf interpreter? How does that happen? What's the need for it? So if we are looking at foreign deaf people, what I will talk about first is that when there is a need for a deaf interpreter, like myself, I am one of the very few deaf interpreters. There's myself, there's another colleague here, Susan O'Callaghan. We don't have official training as of yet, the, the need for deaf interpreters <coughs> um, comes along when we work with a hearing interpreter. You may see somebody using Irish Sign Language, which is used here in Ireland, or in England, they use British Sign Language. Very often people would think that the sign languages <coughs> used throughout the, the world are the same, but each country has their own sign language. So here in Ireland, we have the training of interpreters, we have the acquisition of deaf culture, linguistic knowledge. When we have a foreign deaf person come into the country, for hearing interpreters, there is that breakdown. But for a deaf interpreter, there is that understanding there. Even though we both use different sign languages, we're very familiar with each other's facial expression, body language, and so as a deaf interpreter, there are things that we pick up on. So for a deaf person, intuitively, they know, regardless of where the deaf person is from, that there is that connection. So if a deaf person from another country has been arrested, <coughs> or if, it, if the person is a victim, a deaf interpreter goes alongside a hearing interpreter, and so the communication with the police station is far more fluid. Another scenario may be that if you have a deaf person who would have literacy issues, they may have limited language. So you'd have the hearing interpreter that is interpreting to the deaf interpreter, but the deaf interpreter would have more of a linguistic range in their ability from when they would have gone to a deaf school, so the information is more visual. And so that's the competency competency that the deaf interpreter would bring to that situation. As has been mentioned, I have worked in scenarios. Now, it may not always be, as a deaf interpreter, we may not have availability. There's limited deaf interpreters. Again, as we have mentioned, we don't have training for deaf interpreters. So in order for the Garda Shikana or maybe court services to know the reasons for having a deaf interpreter, this is something that we have to explain to them that alongside having a hearing interpreter, you do have to have a deaf interpreter because the assumption is, is that once you have an interpreter that that just clears the way. But that information is now becoming more widespread with the use of deaf interpreters. In Ireland, we only have, I would say, maybe four deaf interpreters. So when we're looking at the situation here in Ireland, with the Centre for Deaf Studies, there is training provided for interpreters, for hearing interpreters. Deaf people who train, <coughs> who are getting training for interpreters, they're doing workshops on an ongoing basis. Hopefully as part of the Justice Science Project, there has been interpreter training provided for deaf people. 
This is something that has happened just quite recently and it will continue to happen. Anything else, Lorraine? <laughs> because I'm nervous, I have forgotten to say. <laughs> At the moment, I'm currently studying my master's degree alongside the University of Bristol, and it's looking at the professionalism of deaf interpreters and the role of the, of the deaf interpreter. A lot of research that has been conducted here in Ireland with regard to interpreting has been based on hearing interpreters. And then if we were to look at the, the need for deaf interpreters, if we're looking at the, the breadth of linguistic knowledge that a deaf interpreter brings to the, to the work alongside a hearing interpreter, how deaf and hearing interpreters work alongside each other. And so we are looking at that research. So the interest that I have is looking at a deaf, a deaf interpreter, the knowledge that they bring to the job as a deaf person growing up. What are the boundaries when they're working within the deaf community because as Jill has mentioned there is the knowing that a deaf person has met that deaf interpreter in the deaf community and then we have to look at confidentiality as a deaf interpreter. With the Justice Science Project there has been a great opportunity for deaf interpreters to get more recognition. You know, they have been quietly working their way down through the years, whereas with Justice Science now, there's a platform for us as deaf interpreters on a European level. On a European level, there is the booking of, of interpreters that has happened, but only on a few occasions. And one thing that I do find, you know, that is important to talk about, this case that happened last week in Dublin, there wasn't enough deaf interpreters from Ireland. So deaf interpreters from the UK came over to work for the, the client here in Ireland because of the lack of deaf interpreters. So we are looking at developing the number of deaf interpreters here in Ireland as a result of the Justice Science Project. Okay, I think that's it for now, Lorraine, yeah? Okay. Okay, so nearly finished, I promise. Um, I think one of the things that I actually would like to add to what Theresa said is that another reason why we need deaf interpreters is because the majority of sign language interpreters don't have Irish sign language as their mother tongue. Yeah, that's very unusual in terms of when you look at other interpreters. If you're looking at spoken language interpreters, typically the people who are proficient in the other language that you want and maybe have English as their second or third language. Whereas for sign language interpreters, something like 90 to 95% have learned Irish sign language as a second language. So while they may be fluent, they still wouldn't have the same degree of, of nuanced uh, capacity that somebody who has a language as their mother tongue would have. So deaf interpreters really add to that you know, assurance of quality control, uh, and that's another reason why we would need deaf interpreters. Um, so we've got to do a whole pile of things. We've got to look at research-led training for stakeholders. We want to look at the pre-session, the during a session, be that you know a police interview or a victim interview or a court hearing and post-sessional work. Most importantly, though, we want to build relationships. I think that's the essential piece. Uh, and so hopefully today is part of that relationship building piece. Um, you can follow us on Twitter. Jill Harold, get yourself on Twitter. <laughs> she told me that she's not on Twitter. <laughs> get on Twitter, woman. <laughs> and so, and follow us. We'd be delighted to hear from you. Um, and the other thing, just to let you know that in fact, uh, one of our next events is happening in towards the end of June. We're working with the Dublin Rape Crisis Centre. We've worked with them over the years on, on many occasions. And we're absolutely delighted that they're hosting this event for us in Dublin, it's for interpreters, deaf and hearing interpreters, uh, and it'll be hosted in the deaf in the, the Dublin Rape Crisis Centre. Uh, it's it's notionally free, but we are asking people for a donation, and all of that money will go to the Dublin Rape Crisis Centre. So, thank you very much for your attention. If you want to contact us, we'd be delighted. Do you want that? You want a picture? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it's it's up on Facebook and on Twitter today as well. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Jim. Thank you.